Okay, so let's talk about some wind basics first. Um, so wind turbines um, operate uh, in based on uh, aerodynamic principles using lift. So so wind moving around the, the shape of the turbines um, is such that you have a sort of a flat side um, and a curved side to, for each turbine blade. Um, and so wind moving over the rounded face of the blade tends to move faster, M faster moving air. Um, tends to rise in the atmosphere. And so when that happens, you have a pocket of air uh, where there's um, a lower pressure. Uh, and so that lower pressure uh, area of air then sucks the blade in the downwind direction. Um, so it sort of pulls the turbine um, in the direction uh, that it spins as opposed to pushing it. And this is just a funny comic that I found that offers the exact same explanation about uh, why airplanes can fly using aerodynamic lift. Uh, and then the teacher is challenged slightly about why airplanes can fly upside down. And she has three different choices about what type of answer she can give. Uh, and I'm going to actually go with uh, the middle one, which apparently is the wrong answer to give you. But it is complicated and I uh, am not a physics major, so we're going to move on. So if you've ever seen wind turbines operate, um, one of the things that's um, a little curious, at least when you first see them, is that they appear to be moving pretty slowly. And so then the question is, um, how can something that's spinning so slowly uh, generate uh, a, a significant amount of electricity? And so the reason is that there are interlocking gears. So the outer gear uh, that's connected to the turbine itself that's being um, spun around using aerodynamic lift um, is spinning pretty slowly, but then it's, it's interlocked with uh, another gear um, that spins very quickly. And that uh, gear is, is connected to a coil conductor, um, which is spinning within a magnetic field in order to generate electricity. Um, so once again, we're generating electricity by spinning a coil conductor. So here are some sort of fundamental equations of, of wind power. Um, so the, the amount of wind power that you can theoretically get um, the amount of energy that's embedded in the movement of air through a, a given area depends on a couple of things. The amount of air, so volume, uh, the speed of the air, velocity, and the mass of the air. Uh, and so we can first describe the amount of kinetic energy represented by a, sort of a packet of moving air. Um, so Ke equals one half times the mass times the velocity squared. Um, and so power is actually uh, kinetic energy per unit time. Uh, so we need to divide the whole thing by uh, some sort of time dimension. So we're going to say power is one half times this m with a dot on it um, times velocity squared. And that m with the dot on it is just the change in mass versus change in time shown over to the right. So mass flux. Um, and then if we uh, substitute uh, in uh, some other variables for that mass flux or that mass flow rate, um, dm over dt, we can we can substitute that as uh, this Greek symbol, uh, which has which represents the density of the air times the area a of the air times velocity. So we can substitute those variables into our equation for power. And now we get a new equation that says P is equal to one half times the density of the air times the area through which the air is moving uh, times the velocity of the air cubed. Um, and so this is really important because what it gives us is some sense for how much wind power can be extracted uh, by a wind turbine uh, from moving air. And that uh, power is linearly related to um, air density, which we're going to assume is mostly constant when we're talking about putting air or, or wind turbines different places throughout the United States. Um, it is also linear related to the rotor swept area. In other words, the, the size of the circle that's made by the rotation of the turbine uh, and the turbine's blades. And so that is something that we can control, right? We could build uh, larger and larger uh, turbines with um, greater rotor swept areas. Uh, and then, then, of course, the, the velocity of the wind speed or the wind uh, matters as well. So, uh, uh, wind speeds are extremely important. And, and in particular, what you see from this equation is that um, uh, the, the amount of power that you can produce from, from moving wind um, is cubically related to the velocity of the wind, which means that a very small change um, in wind speed or wind velocity results in a pretty big change uh, in the amount of wind power you can actually produce. And so uh, we'll talk about this uh, in a few minutes, but what this means is that um, wind speeds uh, are really important 
uh, in terms of where you where you're going to put wind turbines. So we sort of talked about um, well, we've talked in the past about the efficiency of different types of power plants, uh, coal plants, uh, natural gas plants, um, even hydropower. Um, and what we mean by efficiency is that there's um, there's sort of an upper limit on the amount of electricity you can actually get out of uh, the energy that's embedded in a fossil fuel like coal or or natural gas. Um, and we talked about hydropower being probably the most efficient type of electric power generation um, where there's no sort of heat loss. Uh, and so on the order of 80 to 5 to 90 percent of the embedded energy in the, in the kinetic energy of, of moving water can be actually extracted and converted to electricity. Um, in terms of wind power, there's something called the Betts limit that is the actual maximum possible um, power coefficient that describes how much of the uh, embedded um, or kinetic energy embedded in the movement of air can actually be converted to electrical energy. Um, and what this shows is that up that upper limit is about 60%. So um, there's the theoretical amount of uh, energy that's embedded in the movement of air, and then about 60% of that is the upper limit of how much we can actually convert into electricity uh, using a wind turbine. So let's do an example here um, that is meant to um, really drive home the importance of, of wind speeds um, as a controlling factor in determining how much wind power you can get uh, from a wind turbine. So this question asks, what's the percentage increase in the power output from a hypothetical turbine going from wind speeds of six meters per second to a speed of eight meters per second. Now, so to do this, let's use this equation that we've just derived. So the wind power that's available from a turbine is P equals one half times the density of the air times the area of the rotor swept area times the cubic um, uh, function of the wind speed or velocity times the Betz coefficient, right? So an efficiency of essentially 60%. So let's assume that the rotor swept area uh, is determined by us having 50 meter turbine blades. Uh, so we can determine the uh, area of the rotor swept area by saying um, the area A is equal to pi r squared, where r is equal to 50 meters. Um, Cp is going to be equal to 60 percent. That's sort of our efficiency of the wind turbines. The density of the air, let's say, is 1.23 kilograms per meter squared, and the wind speeds are what we're going to change. In one case, we're going to look at 6 meters per second, and then in another case, we're going to look at 8 meters per second. So we can plug these different values into the same equation. Uh, and the only thing that's different between the green and the yellow are the wind speeds. In one case, we have uh, 6 to the third power. And in the other case, we have 8 to the third power. Uh, and so what you can see is that the power that's able to be produced um, is different, right? So if we have a wind speed of 6 meters per second, we can produce uh, 0.625 megawatts. Uh, and if we are uh, using wind speeds of 8 meters per second, we can produce 1.48 megawatts. And so what this means is that uh, when we increase uh, wind speeds from 6 to 8 meters per second squared, or meters per second, uh, we're experiencing a 33% increase in wind speed. But the amount of electricity we get out uh, that's higher uh, with, a, with a greater wind speed of 8 meters per second is much more than 33% larger. In fact, it's 237% in, uh, increase uh, in wind power. So what this suggests to you is that, again, uh, that the power output from wind turbines is extremely sensitive uh, to actual wind speeds. So given all of this information that we've gone over so far, what do you think the trends are in wind power siting? So the first is that we are building wind turbines larger and larger. Remember, the amount of uh, power that you can get out of a, a wind turbine is directly proportional to the rotor swept area. So the, the circular area um, that's created by the spinning of the turbines. Um, so if you think about the, the, the cost of uh, putting in wind turbines, a lot of the cost has to do with siting the turbine, constructing uh, the foundation for the turbine, uh, connecting the, the wind farm to a substation, uh, maybe building um, some some, some tra transmission capabilities. So all of these costs um, might not scale directly with the actual size of the turbine. So if you're going to build a turbine in the first place, in other words, you might as well build a bigger one. The cost of building um, uh, a really, really large turbine might not be that much more 
um, than building a, a smaller turbine. And you would get more output in terms of electricity generation from the wind farm. The second really important factor uh, that comes into siting of, is, of course, wind speeds. We, look, we showed how uh, the amount of electricity that you can get from a wind farm is cubically related to wind speeds. So what that means is that very small changes in wind speeds result in um, pretty big changes in the amount of electricity that's actually produced by a wind turbine. So this map shows um, average wind speeds at 80 meters off the ground for the entire United States, including some offshore sites. And what we see um, is that the highest wind speeds are offshore in general, but also in the middle part of the country. Uh, so the Great Plains region uh, of, uh, of the United States. So those are, um, in some ways, the most beneficial places to build wind turbines. Now, it's not that simple, and we'll talk about why. Um, but what this gives you a sense for is that there's a, a, a great diversity in wind resource availability across the United States, where there are some places that are probably not a good place to build wind turbines. And North Carolina would be an example of one of those places, at least onshore. So uh, actually, this has sort of the, um, the, the historical development of wind power in the United States has mostly sort of followed this map of wind speed. So what this map shows is the amount of uh, the, uh, the share of uh, total electricity generation in each state that's taken up by wind. Uh, and you can see that the, the, the states in the, the Great Plains, so Oklahoma, Kansas, Iowa, um, uh, Nebraska, uh, the Dakotas, Minnesota, Colorado, um, all of these states that we that we know at this point have really high wind speeds on average um, are in fact the states where we're seeing uh, the most uh, installed new stall installed capacity uh, of of wind power um, in the United States. So another important term um, that, that's a, that's used a lot when we're talking about renewable energy, both wind and solar, uh, is called the capacity factor. So the capacity factor is a value between zero and one. And what it represents is um, the fraction of the year that the turbine generator is operating at, at its um, maximum, or, or maximum or installed capacity. Um, so there's a couple of different things that, that control capacity factor for a wind, wind farm. And the first is the, the power curve of a turbine, right? So um, as wind speeds uh, increase, um, the amount of electricity output from the turbine increases. But um, at some point, um, higher wind speeds don't translate to um, higher power production. The, the, there's a sort of a theoretical upper limit in how much electricity that the turbine can be producing. Um, and when you reach that, higher wind speeds don't give you extra electricity. Um, so different wind speeds um, control how much electricity is um, produced by the, the, the wind turbine. Um, and then, of course, we experience different uh, wind speeds throughout the year, and that's what this figure at the bottom right shows. So we can think about uh, the distribution of wind speeds throughout the year in a probabilistic sense, right? So what this might suggest is that average wind speeds are uh, maybe on the order of six to seven uh, meters per second, uh, but there's a lot of variability throughout the year in terms of what speeds you're experiencing. Sometimes you experience really low wind speeds, uh, and sometimes you experience very high wind speeds. So combining the power curve of the turbine uh, and the distribution of uh, wind speeds throughout the year would give you some theoretical sense for what the capacity factor is. So let's do a, a more applied uh, example here. So let's say we have um, the output from a, a recorded output from a wind farm in Oklahoma. And on the y-axis here, we have megawatt hours of electricity production. And this is for um, just a one week uh, period of time. So we have 168 hours. And, and what you can see is that the output from the wind farm is really variable. Um, and so let's say that this wind farm is uh, 199 megawatts. That's the total amount of electricity it can produce. So if we wanted to get a, sort of an estimate of what the capacity factor for this wind farm was uh, over this one week period of time, we could divide this yellow line, every point in this yellow line, uh, by 199 megawatts. And what that would give us um, is a time series that looks exact, exactly the same, except now all our values are between zero and one. And so the, the periods where we see the wind farm is producing uh, close to or right at one uh, suggests that the wind farm or this turbine uh, is producing the maximum amount of uh, electricity possible. Uh, and the times where we see that the value goes close to zero, that would um, 
indicate a time when uh, the, the wind farm is not producing any amount of electricity. Uh, and so we could take the average of this green line over this one week period of time and we get 0.487. Uh, and so that would be the capacity factor for this wind farm uh, over this one week period of time. And another way of saying that is that the wind farm produces on average about 48.7% of its total capacity, uh, which was 199 megawatts. So on average, it's producing about 97 megawatts. So not only uh, is there geographical di uh, differences in the average wind speeds um, across the United States, there is uh, a tremendous amount of seasonality uh, in, in uh, available wind speeds, and that seasonality also differs across the United States. So what these colored figures represent, um, on the x-axis, you have different months of the year, January to December. Um, and then on the y-axis, you have capacity factor. So again, a measure of essentially how much of a, the total installed capacity of wind farms is actually being uh, used. Um, and so you can see the West Coast, the Northwest and, the Cal and California, the summertime is actually, spring and summer is actually the sort of the peak uh, period of wind power production. And that looks a lot different than the rest of the United States, including the, the plains in the Midwest and New England. Um, where the winter time is the highest uh, period for, for wind power production. So this figure shows you a cumulative installed capacity of wind power worldwide as of 2017 um, by country. So China is the world leader, followed by the United States uh, and Germany. And so this gives you sort of a time series trajectory, at least within the United States, of, of how we've uh, installed uh, or how we've seen wind, installed wind power capacity grow. Um, over the, the last 15 years or so. And so we've seen a really steady, very strong growth uh, over this time period uh, in wind power capacity. Uh, in fact, um, actually wind is, has been uh, the number one or number two source of new generation capacity in the United States. Now that doesn't, let's put that into some perspective. That doesn't mean that um, wind is the most prevalent type of generation in the United States, uh, but it does mean that of the new uh, types of power plants we are building, um, wind has been the most popular, um, sort of tied with natural gas uh, in recent years. And that's what this figure shows here. Um, so again, uh, you know, what we've been doing, um, that what these different colors show are different types of power plants and every bar shows new capacity that's built. So we built a lot of capacity in the 1970s and 80s. And then as that capacity became older, especially a lot of these coal-fired power plants that are dark brown and started being retired in the early 2000s, um, we started replacing them. Uh, and really through about 2008, we were just replacing coal with natural gas. And then you can start to see these green and yellow bars towards the end uh, that represent um, the market share of natural gas generation really declining. Um, and so now the new capacity is basically a mix between uh, natural gas on one hand and wind and solar on the other. Um, but just to, again, to put that into some perspective, um, this is the, the current generation mix in the United States as of 2007. Right. So despite the fact that we've experienced really uh, very strong growth uh, in wind power uh, over the last 15 years, combined wind and solar only represents about 8 percent of installed capacity in the United States. We are still a, a grid that is dominated by fossil fuels. Now, this um, this pie chart, again, differs from some state to state. But on average, uh, we're still relying predominantly on a combination of coal, natural gas and nuclear. So let's talk about the upsides of wind power. The first is that it's really cheap at this point. Um, it is basically the, the, the cheapest uh, type of generation that we have in terms of the levelized cost of electricity, which we'll talk about more. Um, it's plentiful, um, even though not all parts of the United States have really high wind speeds. Um, there are significant swaths of the United States by area where wind speeds are very high uh, that have good wind res resource availability. And then, of course, no greenhouse gas emissions are emitted during operations. So again, this references the levelized cost of electricity. The, the way to think about the levelized cost of electricity is essentially the price of electricity that a generator would have to sell its output for in order to break even over its entire lifetime. In other words, um, it would that's the amount of electricity amount it would have to sell its electricity for to cover uh, 
uh, its capital costs or its annualized mortgage payments and any operational costs that it experiences during its lifetime. Uh, and so I've circled, circled here on onshore wind here. Um, and so onshore wind is uh, by a pretty significant margin, the cheapest source of generation we have uh, right now in the United States. So what do you think are the downsides of, of wind power? So they're mostly related to uh, intermittency. Um, in other words, um, wind power is variable. Um, and then also the way in which it varies is somewhat unpredictable. Um, so both of those cause uh, challenges in, in when we integrate uh, wind into electric power systems. Um, the other issues related to wind have to do with the distance from load centers. Um, so there's a need for a high voltage transmission to connect remote wind farms. Um, think back to that map that I showed of wind speeds across the United States. Uh, one of the issues with wind, and we'll talk about this a bit more, is the fact that a lot of the best areas uh, for, for putting wind farms uh, in terms of access to high wind speeds um, are in areas of the country where not that many people live. Um, and so if we're thinking about um, concentrating you know, wind power production in areas uh, that have really high wind speeds, then another part of that uh, that project would be to to connect those uh, wind farms um, to load centers, to population centers using high voltage transmission, and that can be pretty expensive. 